Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Roblox Podcast. I'm your host, Conor O'Neill, joined today by Joe Thomas and Paul Wheelock. It might have been an Everton free weekend, but there's still plenty to discuss, lads, because at Goodison Park, it's quite simply never quiet. Joe, we'll kick things straight off. As we sit here now, obviously, it's been a few days since the Crystal Palace game. I know you, Gavin, and B spoke on Friday about what happened. As we sit here now, what are your more perhaps analytical thoughts on what you saw on a Thursday night? Obviously, Bar dominated the, the post match discussion, but what did you, you know, think you saw from Everton and, and how Sean Dyche approached that game? I thought it was a good night for Everton. Um, I know that it's easy to you know, the headlines are nil nil draw, um, another game at a time when they could be having a bit of a break, and, and obviously the Dominic Cavalier and the red card, the Dominic Cavalier and the red card, and the Dwight McNeil potentially make it not a good night. Mm. Um, we don't know. We haven't had an update on McNeil's injury as of yet, and the severity of that obviously might impact on on quite where I'm saying because it was a draw and Evans stayed in the cup, but they did stay in the cup at a cost at the end of the day, and we're still waiting to evaluate what that is. You'd hope the red card would have a chance of being turned over, mm-hmm. um, and you hopefully. Dwight McNeil is out for weeks rather than months. And if it's weeks, well, that might be only be a handful of games. So fingers crossed on, on that front. But if the game had finished, I'll kind of rearrange my answer. Say if the game had finished at 70 minutes, I think it was a good night for Everton. And the reason I say that is because it was an opportunity that it was an opportunity for a few squad players to show that they could have an impact in this squad, that Deitch could have placed a degree of faith and trust in them. Um, and I thought that they took it. Uh, Arno Danjuma was was the main one. Been a lot of talk about his Everton future and whether or not Villarreal are unhappy about the minutes that he's received, and as a result, whether or not he could end up being called back and then sent out somewhere else. I think we all would have liked to have seen a little bit more of Arno Danjuma. Um, and you know, because we've seen so little of him, it wasn't clear what he could do. I thought he obviously did well when he. He helped Everton overcome Doncaster in the, the Carabao Cup in the first in the second round. Um, obviously, him and Beto got the goals to change that round. He, I thought he did well. He got the goal against Sheffield United in the two-all draw. And then after McNeil and then Harrison came back from their injuries, we haven't really seen him. Um, but he played well. He played on the left wing, which is particularly poignant now that uh, you know McNeil looks like he's out. He offered Everton a directness that I don't think that... And, and a, Attacking directness, I don't think we see from the wingers that have played most of the season. They've kept him out on merit. They've, they've been very good, McNeil and, and Harrison. But it was nice to see somebody running at a fullback. And one of the conversations that has been going on in recent weeks is about how few penalties Everton do get. Definitely got been hard done by. I, I think the stats bear that out. I could definitely think of at least one in very recent memory, which they should have had. I still can't understand how Inanna didn't get one off Kulisewski against Tottenham. But I think one of the other things that's probably part of the discussion that we don't have or don't doesn't kind of come into it is the type of touches that Everton have in the opposition box. They do a lot of putting in balls from deep rather than... Deitch doesn't seem to ask his wingers to break into the box with the ball at their feet. As a result of that, you're less likely to win penalties because you're less likely to have... You haven't got wingers running at fullbacks. Dan Juma brings that directness, and I thought he did it very well, and I thought he gave Nathaniel Klein a difficult first half, particularly. Um, you know, he he also showed a threat when he went down the middle. Obviously, had the two big chances. The, the first one, you know, he forced a really good save out of, of Dean Henderson. He hit the target. Second one, he brought it onto his left. I think he probably should have taken it on his right first time, but at least he was getting into those positions. So there's Dan Juma, and then you look at Jal Virginia. One of the big question marks for Everton this season has been what on earth happens with Jordan Pickford gets injured or suspended. Massive gamble not replacing Asmir Begovic. Massive gamble. Don't know the, the ins and outs of the contract talks. They offered him a deal in the summer. But for le- leaving themselves in a position where they didn't have a backup to Jordan Pickford with any experience was a worry. Still is a worry. It's still a significant drop-off between Pickford mm. and, and Virginia. But Virginia's now played. He played really well. He made a big save in the last few minutes. Um that's the first time he's ever played in front of fans at Everton, you know, which is extraordinary. 
but it is a bridge that has now been crossed, and as a result of that, Everton are at least in a little bit of a stronger position. On that, you know, when they look at some of those squad players that are question marks over going into this month, we're expecting to be a tight month. We've also seen how just a few injuries have a massive impact on this squad. So we know that the squad is going to be important. And just like it was good to see Michael Keane and Ben Godfrey come in um, and Andre Gomez to a certain extent over December mm. and show that in short bursts, at the very least, they can do a job. We've now seen the same with Shal Virginia and Anna Danjima and I think Everton is... Paul, you were manning things on the Liverpool Apple Sports Desk on yeah. Thursday night with the man in control. Not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> what what we all thought, obviously watching on and watching, you know, as things unfolded. Yeah, it, it was similar to Joe. It was obviously. Uh, I mean, you oh, can have oh, a, a VAR around here because you wasn't yeah, Friday, yeah. so if you want to go full throttle, yeah. 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 Listen to yeah. time, I've said everything I wanted to say <laughs> yeah. on VAR. Joe got his, like his things off his chest on Friday, but yeah. for the, the, the pro- stage I, is yours. If, if I was on the podcast on Thursday night, it would have been a lot more vociferous <laughs> to say the least because <laughs> I thought it was an absolutely yeah, disgraceful decision. And as someone who has not been a fan of VAR for a long time, it kind of just reinforced to me that uh, it shouldn't have any place in football whatsoever. I think it's one of the worst thing that's been introduced into football in uh, in a long, long time. Uh, I understand that if it's used correctly, like Sean Dyke just said, it could be a good thing. But now the fact that big decisions like that, or actually non-decisions like that, are getting refereed again, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, Everton, I know you guys have done a lot over the last few days of the number of VAR decisions that have gone against Everton. And while that's completely true, they're going against a lot of sides as well. I think at the moment everyone's sick and tired of it. So yeah, it, it was left me really angry uh, at seeing another big decision go against Everton. But in terms of the performance, I know probably there was a lot of on social media working on it that night. There was a lot of things nationally where it was saying, "God, what a terrible game! Why did he put that on TV?" And it, it wasn't a classic, that which was fair enough. But as as Joe has really alluded to there, when you kind of take away all the controversy over the sending off and the fact that it was a, a fairly a, a tame nil-nil draw. I actually thought Everton played pretty well. You know, I think that if 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 Cavaloon hadn't been sent off, the story might have been Everton's missed chances because mm. we, they created more than enough in that game to win. Uh, and while that was disappointed that we, we didn't, you know, we didn't get it done on the night and then the team could have had a longer time off between the Villa and, the, and what would have been the fourth round game, it was still a much improved performance, wasn't it, on, on Wolves and, uh, yeah, Dan Juma particularly. Uh, I think I've, I think he's been underused by Dykes. I think he's been underused more off the substitutes bench. I think there's been times when he should have come on earlier. I think, as Joe rightly says there, I think it's very hard to displace McNeil and Harrison from the team and I don't think Dan Juma did himself any favours with that performance against Burnley in the in the Carabao Cup. He didn't really grasp his opportunity that night. But in recent weeks, he really has. Uh, he has looked like the player he was at the start of the season and hopefully McNeil's not out for too long. But... Uh, it looks like we may have, you know, not a ready-made replacement or certainly replacement who is ready to go. Uh, but it was really impressive on on Thursday night, and I wasn't in the grand scheme of things. Take away those last twenty minutes, I, I was I was okay with the performance. You know, quite confident we can we can beat Crystal Palace in the replay and get through to the fourth round. It's quite interesting, isn't it, Joe with Dungeon? Because obviously we've done a predictions what we perhaps want to see and stuff over Christmas for, for the Echo and one of my hopes in January was that I haven't kept hold of mm. Aaron Danjuma because I do believe he's got a part to play I think he can play you know a, a very positive role I think in the second half of the season I think he's got that little bit of skill and that little bit of ability that I perhaps don't have but you touched on it earlier the injury to Brad McNeil could be nice in for a, a prolonged period in, in the team because you you know we hope Brad McNeil's okay but the signs of him leaving on that stretcher didn't didn't ease any fears, did they? No, no, it, it didn't look good. And, um, you know, it may well be that it's Thursday's press conference before Villa that we get a real mm. update. And, and I think that for anybody that follows this, you follow, follows us and what we do at the press conferences, Sean Dyche isn't partic- doesn't go into a huge amount of detail when it comes to, you know, even at the weekend. So even after the Thursday's game, Adrissa Gay was still being assessed, apparently. And obviously he came off and after 20 minutes, on the 23rd of December. So, and, and, you know, I, I respect that Deitch isn't, you know, his job isn't to write stories for us. It's probably to protect information and things like that. So, you know, I'm not saying that he's not within his, his, his gift to be, um, you know, 
tight-lipped over those things. It's perfectly within his rights and and and, and, and fair enough. Um, but until we hear otherwise, there is potential for it to be a real concern for Dwight. Mitchell. There was clear concern over that. He did leave the pitch. You know, he spent a long time on the side of the pitch before he was eventually stretched off. So, mm-hmm. until we hear anything different, I think it's fair to assume that it's not going to be a quick fix. Now, obviously, if there was a month where it was going to happen, it might well be that January was a better month for it to happen because, yeah, you know, there's only two Premier League games. Um, we, we've obviously got the cup replay and then potentially a, a fourth round in, in the FA Cup as well, which we hope we'll get. Um, but because of that injury, it just made Arno Danjima's impact even more important. And I think we have to kind of almost start afresh on Danjima. When Falwell managed to get it over the line in, in, in the summer, obviously it required both parties to move past what happened in January when, of course, he made that 11th hour U-turn and went to Spurs instead. I think one of the reasons that Everton were willing to do that was because there was a belief that he was one of, in a in a market where there wasn't a huge amount available. From Everton's perspective at the start of the window, him and, and, and Harrison were two of the best options that they could see available on the loan market in football in general. And I think that we probably have to agree with that. I think you, know, you see the impact that Harrison's had. You know, I think he's done. I think he's done well. You know, there's still probably a, a discussion to have over whether that'd be enough to sign him in mm. in the summer. Mm-hmm. But I certainly think that it's been a good loan for him, a good loan yeah. for Everton, um, and one that will hopefully be built on. And then Dan Juma hasn't really worked out as much for. But you 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 think that there's probably a degree of stubbornness within Deitch obviously we know that he doesn't like to make substitutions unnecessarily so that obviously hinders hampers the opportunity of someone like Dan Juma to have he's not having the last 15 20 minutes of every game in the same way that you know when they're both fit better might do with Dominic yeah. calvert and he's not coming on for that last 20 minutes and then you know, he might pick up a, a cheeky goal or an assist and it just helps him build and continue his momentum um, but now he's clearly going to be of importance to the squad and hopefully, you know, if one of the, if Villarreal's main concern over Dan Juma is minutes, and to be clear, whilst that's been claimed by Sean Deitch about this, and he says no one has told him that Villarreal have any concerns over the amount of minutes that Dan Juma's got, and he also said if anyone did tell him that it wouldn't have any impact on his decision making. Well, yeah. now I think we probably, all three of us, agree that Everton are stronger with Dan Juma in the squad than without the squad. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to see how they could get a player of the calibre of Dan Juma on loan to replace him should he end up being recalled. Uh, you know, this is a player that scored goals in knockout stages of Champions League football, remember? Um, and it may well be the the decision's been taken out of Everton's hands and they may be forced to use him. And if that is enough to make sure that he gets the minutes in January, I mean, he doesn't get recalled by Villarreal, then that, that might not be the worst thing in the world. That might that still doesn't make it, you know, under no circumstances, a good news that McNeil's injured, but a potentially difficult decision might be taken out of Deitch's hands and it might have a long-term benefit for Everton. We talk, Paul, about you know, Nick Bayman, Dan Juma obviously playing himself into the team, perhaps in McNeil's absence. Gareth Davis watching on YouTube has asked, regardless of the red card, does Dominic Calvert loon need appears out to start 11? He looked jaded and non effective, or should he be given the chance to play himself into form? I mean, this is quite probably very evident in this in that a player that we spent <laughs> two years in this podcast saying we just need to get back in the team. We're not debating whether he needs to come out the team, even though he's, he's fit. But it's obviously a long run for Dominic Calvert loon, I'll find the back of the net. I think it's safe to say he hasn't really had any clear cut openings and chances and the ones he has, you think of the one at Wolves where he went clean through, he seemed to snatch at it and dragged it well wide. Is it maybe time for him to to to, to take a breather and let Beto read the line or does Sean Dyke just have to stick with him and keep... Well, obviously, he's potentially not going to be able to play for the next three games, but that could obviously all change based on the appeal. Uh, it's it's difficult because I, I always feel for an Everton forward <laughs> and particularly because they're not... And for a number of years, maybe since Lukaku, it's it's hard work up there, isn't mm. it? And Dominic Cavalier does a lot of work, a lot of hard work for Everton. Uh, and given, even though since Sean Dyche has come in, 
probably one of the biggest surprises for me has been the amount of number of chances he has created because I thought we'd be having a lot more one nils, you know, a lot more nil nils, and that's not always been the case. Uh, I think since Bramthwaite's come into the team, it's it's a it's resembling a lot more of a Sean Dykes team in terms of solidity in the in the fence. Uh, but even with even with that even with that said. Compared to say the teams higher up the league, Calvert Lewin doesn't get a string of chances, does he? I don't think he goes away each game and says, I've had five chances today. Unfortunately for him, he has had chances recently. I I know you've talked about the one at Wolves, but there was obviously a really big one against Man City when it was 2 1. It wasn't easy, was it? But I think a striker in form clips that over Edison and it goes into the back of the net. I, it's hard for when you see a striker go like go through go through a period like this. I can't. I don't know exactly what it is. Sorry, but I'm sure it's probably approaching seven or eight games now, isn't it? Since he's since he last scored after that really hot streak of form he had uh, when he came back into the side. I I'd, I'd persevere with him. I can understand what the comments are saying there on YouTube because Beto in recent weeks has scored two goals, hasn't he, uh, from the bench? Uh, we've got a bit of a break now, haven't we? Is it? How many days will it have been? It'll have been 10 days, really, something like that. Yeah. Like, hopefully that gives him the time to settle down. If he's fit, I would still start with Dominic Calvert-Lewin. If it doesn't work out against Villa, four days later there's a game against Palace. Uh, at least now we're in a position where we can actually have this discussion where it was probably once we were saying, we need Calvert-Lewin back, we need calvert we need him back first because we've got no other option apart from Mopai, which just didn't work out at all. At least now this is the position where it's a, it's a fair question. What you've said there, I think starting against Villa, I think we need him against a team like that. If it doesn't work out, we can always we can always rest him and give Besso a chance. And if Besso wants to go in and score, it's a challenge that Dominic will have to take on. Joe, it is January, which means one thing: transfers. Obviously, it's the I think the the hot topic at the minute for overall Evertonians and what. They want to see perhaps in January what they don't want to see in January. One player Everton have been linked with, and, I, and I've had talks at Manchester United over a deal with, is Hannibal Med- Medbray. I think I've made said that right there. We'll, we'll call him Hannibal for, 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 for the purpose of this podcast. Interesting, I think, an interesting one, if we're being honest. Um, you know, a wing, midfielder winger, 20 years of age, obviously being around Manchester United's first team this season, but perhaps not had the minutes that he would want in order to, to stake a claim. Are you surprised to see this one, or does this make sense after McNeil's injury? And perhaps this is what's coming to think of Everton that they know McNeil might be out for a while and they need to bring a replacement in. Yeah, just, I'm going to start by just going back on Dominic Calvert Lewin. Just, just one thing I, I do think, yeah, you, know, you, you, you were saying about the, the unfortunate lot of an Everton striker. And it's interesting how we all, when we think about Dominic Calvert Lewin over Christmas, a lot of us think of the, the one on one that he messed up against Jose Sarr and Wolves um, just before New Year's Day. Obviously, which is offside, if it had gone in, it wouldn't have counted anyway. None of us remember the good finish that he did against Tottenham Hotspur when no, Gomez no. played him for Great him. point. Um, Great point. Yeah, which was a very good finish and was a well-taken goal, a big moment in a, in a crucial game that you know, he didn't think would not stand at that point. And it's just, again, it's, that, it's one of the many side effects of the VAR decisions. Just like the points deduction has feels like a punishment that's wrapped up in so many different times because it 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 has an impact on things like what you can do in January and it has an impact on the way in which we're viewing players and their performances now because we're doing it with Everton one point off the relegation zone rather than eleven. You know, so does VAR and that intervention there costs Dominic Calvert Lewin from breaking that duck. And if he scores that, we're not having this conversation. No. If he scores that, he probably also scores against Wolves and mm. you know maybe scores against Manchester City and, and things like that. Hannibal, um, just to come back to your question, kind of a little bit surprised. Uh, obviously, young player, not a huge amount of experience. Um, I think we know it's the type of position that Everton need strengthening, mm. even before McNeil's injury and even before there's any conversation about whether Dan Juma goes or not. I think Everton was still light in terms of wingers and attacking midfielders. Um, there's more to substance to this than there are with some of the other links. Uh, you know, Jesse Lingard is a player that was whose name was being bandied around last week a fair bit. I don't think there's any serious interest mm. in him at this stage. Obviously, transfer windows can can change as they go on, and you know things like Dwight McNeil's injury and and that, and probably learning more about the likes of the fitness of Idris Gay and Adelaide Corey may well end up shaping Everton's mm. transfer window a little bit different. Obviously, if, if Dwight Manil ends, ends up being out for a significant period of time, then you would think Everton would need to do a, a lot more work than they perhaps would have started this month envisaging. Um, but yeah, a little bit surprised. It, it's, 
Everton need players in that position. They need a little bit of creativity. They need a little bit of spark. They need a little bit of competition. Um, Hannibal is clearly a very talented player. He has played minutes with Manchester United's first team. Not a huge amount. I think he's played more international games than he has um, first team domestic games. But I think any anyone that comes in is is a bonus. Anything that squad is so small, any new option is is, is useful. It'd be interesting to see the terms of the conversation that you know the terms of any deal that United would be willing to let go because you would think that in this case it would be very much for them a development loan. They would want him to be getting minutes. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, we've already discussed on this pod how if you're not in his first eleven, getting minutes doesn't seem to be a you know it seems to be quite challenging getting minutes under Sean Dyche. So <coughs> if say for instance McNeil isn't as badly injured as first feared, or if um, Dan Juma hangs on and stays and things like that, then it's in, it's difficult to see where Hannibal's going to get the guarantee for those minutes, and that might be a defining fixture. The other thing will obviously also be finances as well. We know that there are other teams that are in, in form, including Sevilla. Um, now, obviously, I want the best for Everton, but if, if I'm 20-year-old Hannibal and you offer me four months in southern Spain playing with Sergio Ramos and even Rakitic and players like that or, you know, the potentially four months of, 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 of a potential relegation battle at, at Everton, then you know, it may well be that he goes for, for southern Spain. But if he wants to further his career in the Premier League, if he sees himself as trying to get into that Manchester United side rather than trying to get himself into a senior position at a football club in general and being open to where that is, then there's no better place than Everton to come in and show that you can cut your teeth because if you can come in and have an impact um, in the Premier League for Everton, then, I mean, there can't be any better way to show your, your bosses at Man United that you're ready for for a more, um, you know, a, a better role next season with them. I mean, these are the type of things that Everton are going to be exploring. They need to. Finances will come down to it. Obviously, Everton aren't in a position where they can get into bidding wars for players. Uh, for players, um, the severe one is a, is an interesting one because obviously they're a club that have seven 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 influence. So, I mean, I'm a little bit confused by the way in which you, the links were initially reported was Everton trying to hijack Sevilla's deal. And while uh, so while seven 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 have a minority influence at Sevilla and technically aren't in at Everton yet, they're waiting for approval. It would seem a strange situation if they end up in what could potentially be a bid in more over wages and selling fees against themselves. I mean, that would concern me. You'd hope that maybe it was just a turn of phrase and the language has been used and actually someone could have a conversation there. You know, if they're still convinced that they can take over Everton, which they are, you'd hope that in the back corridors of 777, they're going, well, who do we think is going to be better mm. off with this loan? And you know, you think it may well be Everton, and you think if that's the case, then Sevilla will withdraw their interest rather than. But yeah, we we don't quite know. But yeah, intrigued. What what I think what I'm concerned about, and the, the one thing that doesn't need to happen, that must not happen. Sorry, is a repeat of last January, where right at the beginning of the transfer window, Everton were in talks with Manchester United over Anthony Langer, and they were desperate to get him over the line. And it was a deal that would have made a lot of sense for Everton, but it was a deal that was never really on the cards. Um, you know, he didn't leave at all. He didn't go anywhere in, in January. Manchester United were always unlikely to let him go unless they brought in another, you know, other options in, in that area. Um, this one looks like there's more legs to it. It looks like there's a great potential to go for it, and that's great if so. But what I do hope is if, if there are any concerns that it might not be a go, I hope that they move on quickly rather than spend the month chasing something that might not be there. Paul, is Hannibal a player who excites you? Would you be... I uh, can't say I've, I've 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 watched them a great deal. I know. I thought you would have spent your weekends watching some United no. you know, nice than the twenty one fixtures. And... <laughs> no, I, I know how highly I, I know how highly Man United rated him for an, a number of years. Uh, he scored an excellent goal for them earlier this season. He's probably most famous around these parts for kicking Liverpool players all around the park during that four 0 <laughs> a couple of years ago. I think like any self respecting Evertonian would have done at that point. Yeah, <laughs> he got high pace. He even got an level for it. He did. You know, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he came on. I think he made it off about ten fouls in five minutes, uh, which was a pretty uh, humbling night for Manchester United. That one. Uh, what? It's, it's it's hard, isn't it, to get in his position at United because he's got Bruno Fernandes. And like, even though Bruno Fernandes isn't the most likable character, he's a fantastic footballer. So and, the captain. and the captain. And the captain there. So I think his position is is blocks at, at Manchester United. 
I do wonder where he would play for Everton because obviously the core race seems a bit closer, doesn't he? You know, I mean, mm-hmm. he seems to be back in training now, which clearly wasn't going to be risk last Thursday, but you'd hope he'd come into contention for Sunday's game. So he, would he be a potential backup there? Because my understanding of Hannibal, he's more central. He can play mm-hmm. wide, but he is more of a central player. Uh, and it comes down to what Joe was saying there. Would Manchester United be willing him to go to Everton as a squad player who may play marginally more minutes than being a squad player at Manchester United but I think we just need bodies really don't we I think this last few weeks have proven what can happen when the squad gets hit by injuries really and it must be very difficult for Kevin Felwell again currently in the transfer window not alone not only because of the club's financial situation but obviously having to always be wary of financial fair play and profit and sustainability rules we're in the middle of a takeover and even though 777 are clearly helping run the club operationally at the moment with loans and the the stadium, uh, the money owed to, to build a new stadium. It, it seems to be that it's not going towards transfers. So I can imagine that Kevin Felwell is really going to have to beg, borrow and steal again. And as Joe rightly says there, if they like Hannibal, and it clearly they do because they've been in talks with Manchester United, don't let it run on because this at the start of the window, Kevin Felwell may fairly clear in the in the pro in his program notes before Manchester City, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh where he was saying he set up the the scene for January, didn't it? It'd be a low key transfer window. And that you know, he was honest. I think everyone understands that, but equally I'm not saying that Everton fans are kind of like so excited the prospects of Hannibal comes in. We don't want to get in a situation where we're getting linked with players left, right and centre and it comes to the end of the window and no one's brought in because that will just bring a bit of a bad feeling, wasn't it? It'd be different to, to this time last year, but we don't want to be in that same situation again. So I, I backed him. I think uh, I think Felwell's signings on the whole have been pretty good uh, and, and, and Deitch's too. Uh, if they can get him for what I imagine is not a huge loan fee because he's I mean, a young player and if he's got that desire to play in the Premier League if he if he comes to if he says I want to go to Everton or Sevilla that's a big big a big box ticks already isn't it because it shows that he's, as, as Joe said earlier he's got a desire to prove himself in the Premier League I'd, I'd, I'd be up for it because I think it's in a position in the sense in the attacking third of the field where we could do we could do with bodies to be honest Joe as well as incomings there's always talk about outgoings D Hagen and Shane Harvey, both watching on Facebook, are asking about Amazon Nana to Arsenal. Obviously, there's been a report this morning from a Belgium journalist saying that Everton and Arsenal didn't talk over a deal. I think the thing it's worth putting out is, is that there's been a lot of talk for a long time about Amazon Nana and clubs interested in him. And he sees that one of them players, doesn't he, where speculation never quite goes away. And, and he's also said some interesting things himself, I think, yeah, in terms of his, I think his own Everton future that probably I hasn't think helped his that. Camp part of that. It's clear mm. that. Yeah, like I think we're being perfectly honest. I think it's clear that Evans is viewed as a stepping stone yeah. for Amadouin. And I think that we can see that he's probably got the talent to play at a higher level. You know, we'd all rather that be helping Everton get to that higher level rather than remove. But obviously things aren't quite that straightforward. It's a really interesting one with with Arsenal. Arsenal have Arsenal have never not been interested in Amadouinana. Um the most obvious selling point was Sean Dyche's first game when Amadou Anana was the best player on that pitch yeah. by by a mm-hmm. mile. Uh, and at that point, you know, we had the, the Arsenal dressing room on board. You know, the, the players were, you know, I know that there were conversations in the dress, Arsenal dressing room after that game about Amadou Anana and how much of a difficult game he made it for the likes of, of Martin Odegaard. He had the players talking about him, you know, so they clearly saw the talent themselves. But obviously from Arsenal's perspective, you know, the interest is much more is much deeper than that because they're not just going to say one good performance against them. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's been uh, a, there's been low level interest for a long time, uh, and that's likely to, to to still remain. One of the issues that Arsenal have, and this may well affect them this this January, is I think that they spent quite a lot of money over recent seasons, and I think they're relatively close to. I think they're slightly nervous about where. Not nervous in the sense that they there's any danger that they've crossed it, but I think that. They are one of the many clubs that, even more so following Everton's punishment, I think, are aware of where they are in relation to profit and sustainability. Mm-hmm. And I think that's having, from speaking to quite a lot of people in the game over the last few weeks, I think just the those parameters are having a much more of an impact on where clubs are 
viewing themselves, their ability to do business this transfer window than they perhaps been at any other point. Everton's deduction will have filtered into that, but then also just because quite a number of squads have gone through transitions and rebuilds over recent years and are now getting towards the end of three-year periods where they're thinking, oh, yeah, we've just got to make sure that we don't do a deal too many here. Um, so I think from an Arsenal perspective, they want to strengthen this uh, January transfer window. But I think that my understanding of Arsenal is really they want to get players out before they want to consider getting players in. Um, and in the question, there's, there's, there's two questions for, for Arsenal in relation to, to Amadou and Nana. And the first one is, can they get players out first? Eddie Nketiah is one that, you know, is... He, he didn't get. He, he could have got brought on a lot earlier yesterday against Liverpool. Um, for a team that's struggling to score goals and struggling for focal points up front, Eddie Nketiah feels like a player who should probably be getting more minutes than he currently is. Um, so there's you know, likes of Crystal Palace that are interested in him. If someone like him was to go, and obviously I'm not for one second suggesting that he would go for any money in the same kind of ballpark figure as Amadou Anada, but. The way in which the, work, the 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 finances work, you know, you get the full value of the, of the of the sale on your books, even if you don't get the money up front. Whereas if you go and spend money on players, it's amortised, so isn't it? So it, you, know, you don't the full money doesn't come off the books in the in the same respect. So selling someone for twenty million might help you buy someone for hundred million, and still, I'm not saying Nana would be in that ballpark, but um, so one, it's can they get rid of players first? Because uh, I think that would be their priority, and I think second if they are in a position where they feel they can spend money on players this, this January, where do they need it most? And and yes, they probably would have sparked big conversations about do they need a striker more than they need a you know dynamic midfielder like Amadou Anana. Uh, it may well be that two days ago, Onana might have been number one on their list. And after creating so many chances against Liverpool and failing to take them, that might have changed. So those two questions are, are, are really important in relation to, to this. Now, with Everton's position on Anana is, is interesting because I think the reality is that from a financial perspective, I think that if someone was to come along and offer what Everton value Amadou Anana, I think that they, they I don't think they'd stand in the way. Um, Everton benchmark Onana around the Caicedo limit with Chelsea, the Brighton to Chelsea. They see him as a player of similar ability, who's had similar minutes at Premier League football. And, and obviously, Anana's gone one step further, really, and played in major tournaments with Belgium and actually captained the, the national side. So in a perfect world, Everton benchmark Anana around that point. Obviously, Caicedo was a £100 million plus deal. The reality is we're not living in a, in a perfect world and there's still a lot of instability around Everton off the pitch and where they are financially. Um, so they probably wouldn't, wouldn't hold out for that kind of fee at the minute because of you know their own financial issues. So if you're Arsenal or if you're any club, and we've said this a few times on the pod and I've written it a, a few times as, as well, this January is quite interesting for Everton because if you're a club with a lot of money and you see an Everton player who you think could have a long-term impact on your club, and I put Brantweight in the same category, we don't know what's going to happen next at Everton, but one version of events, the version of events that we hope is, is, is carried out, is that Everton end up in a position where over the next few months they find financial stability and the strong foundations that they're building on the pitch are matched by strong foundations being built off the pitch. And if that's the case, come the summer, the likes of Onana, the likes of Brantwaite, Everton will be able to mm. push clubs a lot more to their you know, closer to their valuation for those players if, if, if clubs want to come in for them. This might be the last transfer window where you might be able to come to Everton and just like you know we saw it in the papers for the F, for the uh, profit and sustainability case, just like Richarlison, mm-hmm. Spurs were able to come in and pay sixty million when Everton wanted eighty million. There might be an opportunity to do something similar with Everton this month because of that uncertainty financially. So if you're an Arsenal and you think, well, we would definitely want to go for Anana in the summer, or you know, if you're someone you think I would definitely want to go for Brantford in the summer, you might have a look. You might have a cheeky little you know, put the question into Everton now and just see, because you might be able to get him for it's still big money, but still a lot cheaper. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of moving parts within that. Um, I'd say Arsenal are definitely interested in Amadou and Arno. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I'm not sure at this stage in the transfer window, whether it's something that they could seriously pursue and get over the line. That might change if they can sell a few players and look at their squad that 
that way. Um, the other interesting thing from Everton perspective is obviously as we speak about finances there, and any deal would have to be for enough money for Everton to consider leaving. Price probably goes up a little bit at the minute because Decore has spent the last few weeks out injured, and again, whilst he's probably close, you still you still worry that there might be a lingering impact of of, of injuries, and you want to see how that plays out. Idrissa Gay is out injured. Um, we're still not entirely clear where that is. Obviously, we know Dwight McNeil is out injured. We don't know how long for. Dominic Alvaloon potentially suspended for three games. Obviously, that's a short-term thing. Andre Gomez is back and fit, but, you know, how much of an impact he's like to have this season is, is questionable. Everton are in a difficult place to be letting team players that would start in the starting 11 go at this present moment. And I think as well, it's always worth putting out, isn't it, on our other... I know this from a Manchester United perspective, for instance, that he was a player that the United were well aware of when he was at Lille, but it was felt that he needs to take a step before stepping to mm. a Manchester United or Arsenal. At first, it looked like it was going to be West Ham, but he was going to take that step. Obviously, Everton hijacked that deal in the later stages and managed to get it over the line. Paul, Peter O'Hanlon on Facebook has said that 100 million and he'll drive him to London himself. We need a creative midfielder and a new holding midfielder. I think it's safe to say now, this transfer on either side is going to cause debate. If you know, we, mm-hmm. if, if it's to transpire that talks are held and it becomes a little bit more formal, more than just interest, because you well suspect that Arsenal fans will be sitting there saying, "Why are we signing the midfielder? We need a centre forward. We're not going to win the league if we can't score, score and goals." And Everton fans will be looking at that thinking, "Well, if the price is right, you know, he's a bit hot and cold." Got lots of potential, but we don't perhaps see it enough. It doesn't take the games by the scruff of the neck. And I think a few is probably still scarred by that penalty miss against Fulham as well in the, in the Carabao Cup. I think if Everton got a £100 million pound offer for Amadou Anana, I think the decision would be taken out of Sean Dyche's hands and it would be sold. Mm. Because even yeah, though I, they, I agree if, with that. Yeah. Even if they benchmark him as £115 million pound or similar to Casado, and I understand that. Uh, the Casado is never worth £115 million. Pound. Maybe Declan Rice is worth £100 million. Pound. Jude Bellingham is definitely worth £100 million. Pound. And more. <laughs> and more. And, and Chelsea have vastly yeah. overpaid for Fernandez for Casado and probably Lavia as well, or even though he's and Mudrick. Been, and Mudrick. They, <laughs> yeah. they, they've skewed the market to a ridiculous extent. And if they somehow get away with <laughs> yeah. having sustainability rule as well, that's, that's another question altogether. I think if anyone came in with that kind of bid, even at this stage where, you know, Everton really cannot be looking forward to losing a midfield player because given the injury to just a guy and, you know, we're not completely sure on the core race full fitness yet. I, it would be a terrible timing, but I think anything like that, I, I just think that's that's impossible to refuse. I think if you're talking 60 million, I see that's been gossip, uh, bandied about in the gossip columns. I'm, I'm not quite sure that would be enough for me. But again, as like Joe said, Without knowing the full situation, it could be a Richarlison situation where it would still it would still represent a significant profit on what you know on what they've uh, what they brought him for a couple of seasons ago. Uh, An honour himself, yeah, he definitely does divide opinion. Uh, I thought he played really well on Thursday. Mm. I thought he did have a really good mm-hmm. game against Eze. Uh He let himself down against Fulham, like. Uh, you know, it's, there's just no getting away from that. If you're going to take a penalty like that, you've got to score it. There's just no other way. And I know it's probably showing me age now, and it's like your dad show kind of thing. But you are, got a, you are, I, I, you I, are I am dad, so yeah, I can get away with this now. <laughs> you know? I'm officially good as and dar now. So <laughs> you get a penalty like that, you hit it, don't you? You know, you've got a chance to get you through to a cup semi final. You hit it. And there are times against City, I thought, I thought he was. I didn't think he played great against City. It's very hard against City, really. Because I thought. On a separate note, for 20 minutes, that was one of the best performances in the second half from a team mm. I've seen in Goodison in years. I thought they were absolutely magnificent. How to look the ball. <laughs> like, yeah, I had my young son with him and I said, he was getting upset and I said, you are literally watching the best team in the world there. But yeah. uh, that's on a separate note. I, no, I, really, I like Anana. I think he's going to be a hell of a player. He'll probably become a hell of a player away from Everton. I think, as Joe rightly said earlier, I think there's... Everton may have to accept a bid eventually anyway, but it's clearly he does see us as, uh, does, does see as a bit of a stepping stone. And you know what? That's not nice to say, but it's understandable in the situation Everton are in. And if he, even if this takeover from some, some, some partners goes through, or if there's another takeover, however it plays out, unless there's, 
you know, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and money's no objects, Newcastle style. And I'm not ever even sure I'd want a Newcastle mm. style takeover. I still think this will be the model that Everton will have to, 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 to use for the foreseeable future. And if Anana, for instance, doesn't go in January, but goes in the summer for 70 million, I think we all shake hands and go, well, it's worked out for both parties. But I, I, at the moment, I'd rather see Anana in the Everton team than, than not. Yeah, just that's it. I think the issue isn't would Everton accept a big bid for Amadou and Anna. It's whether a club that's interested can get that big bid yeah. together. I think. I think one of the already kind of touched on this, you know, in the in Hannibal um, discussion a few minutes ago. But again, another important thing for Everton to do this transfer winner to learn from last January is. If there is genuine potential for Amadou and Anna to go for a club to come in with an offer that's big enough for them to be tempted to allow them to go, it's got to be a deal that's done early. If those conversations are happening now what you know, or happening over the last few days in the first week of January, if they're serious, put a deadline on it, get it done by the middle of January. So then you've got an opportunity to, you know, Everton, I'm not saying that they'd spend anywhere near all the money that they got for that deal. But you, given the state of that squad, you would think that they'd have to use some of it to bring players in. And if that is the case, they need as much time as possible to do that because we saw this unfold with with Anthony Gordon in um, January of last year where it was Willie will will won't he, will he won't he, will he won't he, and all of a sudden he goes at the last minute and you know, there's a pot of money, some of which could potentially be spent on players that are desperately needed for the squad. And it isn't because getting... You know, getting deals over the line in the final days when clubs know you're desperate, but also know that you've just had a windfall of, of, of cash is a very, very difficult situation for someone like Evan to be in. So if there are, if there is genuine legs in it, I think there's genuine interest, but I'm not sure that Arsenal could quite at this present moment in time put put the bid together to get it over the line. They might be able to you know, later on in the window, but if there is legs, put a deadline on it and get it, you know, make sure it gets done early doors so that the likes of Kevin Fowle can then have options going forward in the window. Joel, just to stick with you, obviously there was some interesting 7-7 news emerged yeah. uh, last night and this morning. I don't think it's any surprise to anyone that they've injected more cash. Obviously, we've seen that happen a few times now since they come in. But I think the big thing for me and myself and Paul talking about this this morning when we both come in, Alan Myers proposed that the takeover could be, you know, mm. any day from being kind of confirmed either way. And I think now that is the most important thing, isn't it? Is an outcome sorted and everyone knows what's going on and this whole kind of process comes to an end and Everton know where they stand and who's in charge of the football club moving forward. Yeah, um, you know, obviously the news being that 777 investments now up to about £150 million, pounds, I think. We have, we last reported just before Christmas, it was at £100. Um, you know, the, the reality is that you know, a decision is has got to be any day soon. Uh, mm. That's not a news we've been in, you know, in limbo waiting for this and you know, with the anticipation was the hope, well, not answer, the hope from the 777 point of view was always ambitious. Um, as I wrote back in in, in, in September, um, it was always ambitious it would get over the line from the regulatory bodies by the end of, of 2023. Uh, clearly it hasn't. But I think even 777 have put a bit of a deadline on it now. That might be a case of them trying to influence the process mm. um, and trying to hurry up. But they're not going to carry on putting money into the club indefinitely. Um, and we know that you know FCA approvals there, the FA approval. I don't think we've got official word that's there, but really the FA are very heavily led by the Premier League. So this 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 does come all down to the Premier League's deliberations on on seven 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 as a potential fit and proper and suitable owner for 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 a Premier League football club. And you know they're going to have to come to a decision sooner or later. And I mean it's quite interesting really when you just look at all the different. All the different ways in which Everton are currently hanging on the word of the decisions of the Premier League, because will the Premier League approve or not approve the takeover? Well, that's in their hands. You know, we've got the appeal waiting on the points deduction. What's going to happen with that? Really, bearing in mind how quickly Everton signalled their intent to challenge it, it's disappointing that the appeal hasn't already been heard. Like, you know, again, something that we've spoken about a lot and written about a lot is the impact that finality on that decision can have on the transfer market. You know, there are lots of teams, including Everton, that would could do with knowing where they stand on terms of that point deduction, in terms of relegation battle. Because whether Everton get 10 points or whether Everton get 6 points or whether Everton get no points 
could be the difference between the likes of Luton, Burnley and Everton and a couple of other clubs spending money or not this mm. is January. Mm-hmm. Um, if we want competitive fairness, then surely it's, it's in everyone's interest for that decision to be reached as quickly as possible. Clearly it hasn't and it's still ongoing. Um, and then there's also the fact that right now the, the Premier League are, are going through Everton's books and those of other clubs as well in the Premier League for their 2023 financial accounts to see whether or not there's any further issues in relation to profit and sustainability. So, you know, Everton find themselves in a difficult position, really, where the Premier League have a really, really big say in a lot of different factors in, in how the club's going to move forward. We could do with answers as soon as possible. We know that yeah, they'll Everton will find that if there's any concerns over profit and sustainability for the 2023 financial year, we'll find that out by January 14th, January 15th. But with the appeal and the, the, the takeover decision, again, clarity is needed as soon as possible. Paul, you're shaking your head there. and <laughs> Slightly <laughs> concerning that our fate is in the, the hands of the Premier League. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, is the, that, is the, that is the reality. I haven't found ourselves in though, isn't it? Well, well, he, he, he says as he just slides his Premier League corrupt um, <laughs> yeah. poster yeah. under his yeah. 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 And and they, they, I've got the green one as well. Collecting them in a wheel of house. Yeah, we're yeah. going to frame them at the end of the season. Uh, <laughs> My neighbour has those up in the window. <laughs> But, but, there's one by yeah. man who've got, yeah. got who's done something similar oh no yeah it's it's a big month isn't it it is a big month uh yeah it's a i don't know how to feel it i don't know how to feel as an Evertonian about the whole takeover it, it it almost feels like it has to go through because it's the last show in town uh because again it feels like Michel at the moment has withdrawn his backing of the club while it appears that 777 are providing it in this kind of limbo period the reports you read about 777 i've got to say i'm not completely sold on their ownership there's a lot of ragged flags mm-hmm. for me you know we've seen a, the latest one from genoa didn't we we've heard things from vasco da gama and genoa was one that's supposed to be the one that was the you know the positive case the club ownership i'm not saying so in a kind way i'd probably say the jury is very much out for me but i am fearful of what would happen if the takeover wasn't to go through? Because would Mashiri then just go, okay, I've got to take my responsibilities again and continue funding the club? Or do you have to get really scary moments? What can happen? We've seen it with our neighbours Liverpool, didn't we? Uh, Nixon Gillette. Yeah. They, 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 there are, I'm not, I'm not, right suggesting, I'm not suggesting that would happen at Everton, but there is. It, there, there could be potentially scary moments and then perhaps someone else would come forward, but it's all it's all conjecture at the moment. But it does feel like things are coming to a head, doesn't it? You know, the fact that, you know, Alan Mai's reporting that they are, they are expecting a, a decision within days. You'd hope, as Joe rightly says, it's an absolute... I think it's a disgrace that if the if the uh, if the appeal against the points deduction is not heard before the clubs find out if they have uh, failed, uh, well, they, they may potentially be charged for last season's accounts because it's probably right that the Premier League charged clubs within the same season for the previous season. But it's just Everton's luck mm-hmm. that they become the test case previously, and then you know potentially could get hit with more. That's again, that's another story. Hopefully, that's not the case. But it just feels like yeah, things are coming to a head. And I think it has to, doesn't it? it? Unfortunately, it has to. We need to get to the bottom of who's going to be running the club, and it, it, and then then we'll see what's if if it is seven seven seven. I know they've they've done various bits of communication, haven't they? You know, I wasn't particularly over enamoured with the uh, the email they sent out to season ticket holders because I didn't I didn't need to be condescended in the way I was there. Personally, that's my own opinion. Uh, I'd I'd rather come to people like Joe, you know, if it all goes through and get real answers or try and get real answers. And answer proper questions. Answer proper questions, yeah. You know, I'm I'm I've I've gone through enough as an Evertonian in recent years. I don't need to be, you know, you know, like flannel with stuff. I don't need to give us a history lesson. Yeah, I don't I, I like I it wouldn't bother me if you didn't know who Alan Ball was personally. Uh and I've that I've got that's just the way I feel at the moment. I I it's it's a huge institution, Everton and you know, even though I don't like what the Premier League have done to Everton, it's still quite, you know, an inglorious position that we've been put in by the people who've run this club in recent years that we are talking about a potential owner having to fund us by 150 million over the last few months and to be having a points deduction. And for all the protests the fans have had to go through in recent years to make their point known. So, yeah, it, it, it feels like it, we're coming to a crunch time, doesn't it, off the field? You see there, one thing we talk about one thing we will be talking about 
around quarter to eight, I think eight o'clock, before Manchester United take on Wigan at the DW Stadium. Fourth round of the FA Cup draw, which Everton are in, although they perhaps not fully in, given they have a replay against Crystal Palace a week on Wednesday. Paul, I'll stick with you. Any preferences? What you want to see out that magic hat tonight? Home or the draw. Ball, or the ball bag now, is it? Is, is... Home draw. That'll do home me. Draw. Yeah, home draw. Bar from, bar from probably City. Like, because I just think... How many just, games just City? City. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm generally about this. I think City, I've even like seven or eight on the good yeah. side on the run. It just feels like there's absolutely no points at the moment. And I know there's other clubs uh, who've got good records at Goodison, but I'm, I'm, I'd be always... You know, you know, that's like the minimum. You know, quite like Maidstone at home. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was Maidstone who won, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah, yeah, National League. yeah. One so maybe that, that'd be a great day for them. Pretty confident we get through, uh, but no home draw, home draw as long as anyone bar city. And, and we can podcast at the end of January when, <laughs> when we know what comes after that. <laughs> yeah, after after that Maidstone prediction. knock us out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Joe, any, any preferences? For obviously, your team who you support were, were, were beaten yesterday in, uh, by Wrexham, yeah. the millionaires of Wrexham. Wrexham would be an interesting one, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah that would be a great Wrexham story. Yeah. We know, we, we know it'd definitely be on TV because obviously there's a, lot of, there's a lot of love around Wrexham at the minute. I think, I mean, again. This is why not lose. This is why it was a good result on on Thursday. If Everton had lost, then we'd be in a month with two games in thirty days. With Everton sitting there on five consecutive defeats, mm, yeah. Uh, during a transfer window where we know there isn't going to be huge oh. amounts that's going to be happening, and when you think about mood and you think about momentum and atmosphere during a quiet month where we've got a lot of time to do things like this and sit around and talk and speculate and stuff like that and ruminate, you know. It's so much, it's so much of a happier place doing that, knowing that you're still in the FA Cup, and yeah. albeit still with a replay, because you get nights like tonight when at least there's a little bit of interest, and you know, obviously you'd far you'd fancy Everton's chances at home against Palace, you can certainly do beat the beat them there, and then you know you get a nice fourth round draw, and then all of a sudden you you know you're thinking. Odds on it to be fifth round of the FA Cup. Mm. Anything could happen. We yeah. and we saw how important that was with the Carabao Cup. They've only got to the quarterfinals, but just through that crucial period. I mean, firstly, the win at Aston Villa just was. It was the same week as that win at Brentford, where it just seemed to kickstart. Not the good run of form under Sean Dyche. That still took a little bit of time because we still lost to Luton then, but it ignited a little bit of belief that the squad was capable of doing things that it hadn't been capable of doing for the last two years, like win away at good opposition. And we saw how that then continued at Crystal Palace, at Forest, at West Ham, and and so and Burnley, and 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 so on. So, just like that, the FA Cup has the potential to just carry the bit of momentum forward a little bit, you know, a home draw against a side that Everton would be favourites against. Yeah, home draw against a non-Premier League side would be would be perfect. Um, failing that, I wouldn't mind going to a ground that I've never been before or something like that. It would be be quite cool. Made so, I mean, it would be um, depending on depending on, on, on when the fixture was, you know, I'd probably rather not have to stay overnight somewhere again. The family might be a little bit frustrated, <laughs> especially with, with 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 Fulham away also in in, in midweek coming up. But you know, I think um, Newport won at the weekend, didn't they? They've been to Newport. I've been to Spicy Park. Yeah, yeah. I've like, been to Newport. Uh, the place, yeah. not the grounds. I mean, they. I mean, to be fair, they they had a reputation for they they pushed a lot of good clubs hard at their ground didn't they for for a couple of years they dumped Leicester out a couple of years ago didn't they they did yeah they did and they they pushed Tottenham hard in the next round Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah Tottenham got it over the line but yeah stuff like that but yeah Wrexham Wrexham would be an interesting one wouldn't it uh, as I say, I'd say the, what away at Wrexham would be a hard game. It would be a hard the game. The around it would, would make for some, you know, all, yeah. all of a sudden, if Everton ended up playing Wrexham, then you just you just think what looked like it had the potential to be a very, very quiet month a week ago becomes a very, very uh, interesting and one. I'm sure it? plenty of people have you know, you know, I have seen, you know, I, I'm one of few people that can probably say Everton assistant manager Ian Wone, I've seen him score from direct from a corner at the race course ground wow. before. So. Yeah, obviously you can dust off his boots and help Everton again. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will leave things there, gents. I think we've chewed the Maybe, question. I mean, if we could get Ryan Reynolds on the show, couldn't well, we? Yeah. Well, yeah. Great see, job, wouldn't you, it? Yeah. you would suspect that the story of Paul Mullen being released by Everton Liverpool will be told by numerous of the outlets yeah. be, be in their build-up to that game, to the scouts who plays up top for the League 2 club. But, gents, we will leave things there. I think we've chewed the fat enough. Been quite an interesting showing, like an Everton free weekend. We've still nearly done an hour, yes, it's just non stop, isn't it? But Joe, Paul, thank you very much for joining me. You've been listening to the Real Blue Podcast. 
Thank you.